Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, The Joyful Frugalista, and now here's your host, Serena Bird. This podcast is brought to you by The Joyful Fashionista, an online marketplace for buying and selling secondhand and sustainable clothing. Make cash selling as you declutter or buy sustainable and fabulous fashion. Yuma Frugalistas and welcome. Today I have a special guest and of course all of my guests are special. My guest today has considerable knowledge about property, something that I have a passion for and we're going to talk about what's happening in the property market and whether or not it's time to panic. Hopefully the answer is going to be no, it's not time to panic. (laughs) Lloyd Edge is director and founder of Oz Property Professionals. He is a buyer's agent, property strategist, and author of the best-selling book, Positively Geared. His new book, Buy Now, is the ultimate guide to owning and investing in property. Lloyd was a finalist in the 2021 Real Estate Business Awards for Buyer's Agent of the Year, and Oz Property Professionals was awarded Property Strategist of the Year for 2022 by A. PAC Australian Enterprise Awards. Welcome, Lloyd, and congratulations on your awards. Hi, Serena, and great to be with you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, property, how did you get into property? Well, interesting uh, story there because I wasn't always into property. So, I actually started out my career as a musician and a music teacher. Wow. A relatively low income at the time. And uh, I actually just sort of, um, you know, fell into property uh, thinking that I need to create a better life for myself in the future. So when I was single, I was thinking in the future, I need to have, I'm going to have a family, I'm going to have kids. Uh, I need to have a little bit more stability than what I was going to uh, create just on a a teacher's wage at the time. So I started to invest in property and I really was doing it without any kind of a strategy or anything at the time. I was just sort of investing what looked like to be good areas and sort of just doing what other people were were doing. And then, uh, you know, sort of investing that, uh, you know, buying stuff that uh, might have been negatively geared and, and all the things that I don't really do these days. And then later on, I developed a bit of a strategy about how to, to really focus on the best areas and also the best strategies in terms of, of cash flow and manufacturing equity and everything like that. Yeah, over the years, I built up a, a sniffing portfolio, started to do quite well, and then realised that uh, I can really create some long-term financial independence through property that I can't work in my day job. So I really realised that I, I've got to stop trading my time for, for work. And eventually I got to the point where the passive income I was getting from my investment portfolio was more than what I was earning a whole year as a salary uh, employee, as a teacher. <laughs> so I, I retired from teaching and, uh, and then the rest is history. And then I, I really uh, went on to just work uh, with my passion, which is just continuing to buy property. And, and now I help people to do that as well. So I'm sort of combining my passions now, which is education and property. Well, thank you for that. And what an unusual journey that you've had from the poor muso, as people often think as musicians, to being a property magnet. Let's talk about your music. So what kind of musician, singing, instrument, what was your passion there? Yeah, so I was a brass musician. So I played uh, the trombone and I went to the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. And uh, and then uh, after that, I did some professional playing and then basically got into teaching and a, and a bit of conducting. And that's uh, what I did for many years and uh, you know was was quite passionate about uh, teaching and, and everything like that which is uh, I guess that that passion for education has never really left me because even nowadays I'm helping people with learning about property and everything so I've always had that, that passion for, for helping people but that, that was my journey in the early days was basically teaching music uh, teaching brass instruments uh, conducting bands and things. I just love that because I think sometimes people think that you have to be a certain career like you know a doctor lawyer accountant in order to have wealth but that's not necessarily the case. Not at all. And in fact, if you look at the some of the, the best entrepreneurs uh, in the world, some of the most successful people didn't even finish school. So you, you can't need, you don't really need to look at people who have got, you know, several degrees to be successful like that. So uh, it really is about having a passion and then have it, having a drive and then really, you know, setting a path to to achieve that, that those goals that you're, you're looking to achieve, essentially. And I agree with you. I think abundance can come from anywhere. And it, you're right, it's not necessarily the super wealthy or privileged to do that. It's all about, I guess, good strategies in place. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes the, uh, you know, the more wealthy people aren't necessarily, like if you're from a very wealthy family, you're not necessarily going to 
uh, have that drive to uh, yeah, to achieve there because you've already got a, got that wealth there. Whereas if you come from a poorer background, often those are the people that break that cycle and move and, and try to create a better outcome for their own families moving forward. Uh, so I, you know, I grew up in a very happy household. My parents gave me everything that I, I needed, uh, that I wanted. But uh, we, you know, we didn't have a lot of money or anything like that. But we had enough at the time. But looking back now, I am, um, you know, trying to create, a, you know, a, a probably a more stable and better outcome for my own kids moving forward. And that's just, that's just trying to sort of move up, move up the rung a bit and make sure that there's some, some good stability there financially wise moving forward. Yeah, financial stability is huge, especially with a family. And it's something that I think is really quite amazing. I often tell my kids, okay, I mightn't be giving you really, really expensive presents. Although that said, they do, or they do okay. For all that I am typecast as being very frugal, my kids do okay. They do fine. But the, the thing is, it's that long-term stability. It really gives you choices. Absolutely, it does. And even now, I'm, I'm still very frugal. And I always, often have these jokes with my, my wife because I'll go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a property, but I won't spend any more than $20 on a, on a shirt at Kmart and things <laughs> like that. So I'm very frugal when it comes to uh, you know, the everyday type of uh, stuff and things like that. And I think that a lot of that comes back, back to my background. You know, I'd rather save money, invest money, uh, certainly that waste money on, uh, on things. Mm, exactly. And I think it's a really important lesson for your kids too, the way that they watch you do this. Yeah, absolutely. That's really important because, uh, you know, as they grow up with some, some good opportunities, I want to make sure that they remain grounded. And what's important there is that the most important thing for them is to remain grounded with their with their friends and be very accepting of everybody. So, you know, the last thing we want is to, you know, have our kids thinking that they're, they're a peg above anyone else because they've got more wealth or anything like that. It's really important that, that they're really grounded there. Mm, I, I totally agree with you. To have those honest money conversations with your kids early on is really important. So let's go back to property. Many people have bought into the boom over the last 12 months or so. And it's, gee, what a ride. Like I remember people were panicking in March, April 2020, thinking the market was going to drop. Uh, landlords were panicking. A lot of tenants were unable to pay or were asking for different kinds of assistance. And then suddenly we've seen this boom. So what next? Well, it's, it's, been, it's been a really crazy ride the last uh, couple of years and it's, uh, it's amazing the amount of uh, economists and everyone that did come out and sort of predict these big 40, 50% drops in house prices and it just didn't happen. And I for one was basically saying I, I don't see that happening. Uh, I think that it was definitely going to, I think that I could always see that the pandemic was actually going to be good for house prices, uh, a bit like when the GFC occurred, things uh, really plummeted for a little bit then and then really moved forward. What's really happened was a little bit unprecedented because we've had like an, an extra amount of, of boom, just massive um, house price growth all around the country. People have been jumping on that. And unfortunately, part of the problem is the FOMO. So you know, people, uh, I think people have, did, have done the best are probably those that jumped on things in you know, May 2020, you know, before mm-hmm. things really took off. When people were ju- still jumping on things you know, last year and just getting that FOMO, thinking, oh, the, you know, the price is really taking off, we really need to jump on it now. You know, some of them might be having a little bit of hurt because they might have paid a little bit too much for property and now the interest rates are going up, there might be a, a, you know, a few things that they've got to contend with um, from that perspective. Where things are going at this stage is uh, I, I see that the, the markets are starting to slow down, particularly in the capital cities. The regional markets are still quite strong and because they've got mm. quite good price points, I'm still seeing some good value there and also some good buying in those areas. And they're much more stable markets as well. Yeah, the property markets around the country, there are several different markets. So you can't sort of stereotype uh, it just as one one property market. There's, there's several markets in the country and they all sort of move a, a little bit differently. The interest rates are the lowest they've ever been. They have to go up at, at some point. And they are? Well, that's right. But even when I started investing, the interest rates were, were 9%. For me, uh, you know, I'm not scared of uh, little interest rate rises at the moment. Uh, and I think the people that are sort of more concerned about that at the moment are people that have never really seen interest rates or, or paid interest because they've just got in over the last uh, year or so and then suddenly their money was so cheap and now it's getting a little bit more expensive but things are going to pl- um, plateau out uh, and we'll see probably you know towards the end of this year to the middle of next year that uh, things are start uh, will you start to plateau out inflation will be hopefully under control interest rates will sort of stop increasing and uh, and then you know the markets will start to stabilise at this stage where um, you know we're seeing the market slow down a little bit, which does provide still some opportunities, particularly for first home buyers to get in because there's not the FOMO around that there was six months ago. Mm, 
there's a lot in there to unpack. But one thing that you said that I think is really, really important is that the capital cities do not represent the whole of Australia when we're talking about property prices. And I live in Canberra and people often sort of equate our market to what's happening in Sydney market, which is very different. And I know I've had conversations with my dad and he's at various times he's been panicking going, oh, property prices are dropping or they're, everything's kind of doing something. And I'm like, stop. That market doesn't represent the market where I live and where I invest. So they're quite different areas and quite different dynamics. Very different. Uh, and in, in general, you're, you know, you're always going to see more ebbs and flows in, in the capital cities, particularly the larger uh, capital cities such as Sydney and Melbourne. But the regional markets, you know, they don't have the booms or busts as such. So you're not going to get such high price growth uh, overall, but you're also not going to see, you know, the price declines. They're just going to be more stable. So a much safer way to put your money as well if people are a little bit hesitant about, you know, where to invest in everything. And what's been really interesting too has been what's happening with regional markets during COVID for a number of factors, as you know. But I guess what said it all to me was one of my friends in Canberra one day out of the blue bought a property in Chinchilla and moved with her family there. Like they weren't even thinking of it in the morning, but by that afternoon they put an offer on the place and they'd moved. And that was driven by affordability, by, you know, the incredible boom we had seen in, in Canberra, which made buying a property virtually unaffordable for her here, here. And also the ability to work from home. So Hubby was able to negotiate a stable Commonwealth Public Service role working from Chinchilla. Absolutely. Um, I've seen so much of that. Uh, I buy a lot of properties regionally. Um, I, I have a lot of properties personally in the regional markets as well as the capital cities. But I also help a lot of clients through my business buy a lot of properties regionally. And I've seen, you know, firsthand the, the sea change, um, the people that are wanting to move out because they have, they can work from home. It's cheaper to buy in the regional markets and you get more for your money. So, you, can, you know, you can get that quarter acre block um, or in some, some cases you can, you can buy yourself an acre and a, and a large house, things that you just can't do in, in the cities. So, yeah, that's been fantastic. And for investors, the you know the yields are really high there, so you can get uh, certainly would be higher compared to the capital cities. So investors can actually get good yields, which is much more you know positive than what you can get in those uh, capital cities. So so all around that's been been really good, and and the sea changes are still happening uh, to some extent as well. So uh, so and that's sort of propping up those uh, those regional markets. So what advice would you give to someone who's maybe looking to move out of a capital city to move to a regional area for affordability? Well, look, at the end of the day, you need to just look at what your long-term goals and, and everything are. But, it, you know, if you're looking for affordability, if you can work from home and you can negotiate something where you can, uh, you know, move away from the capital city and live in a regional area, I, I think that you'll um, yeah, absolutely love that, the atmosphere there, because, you know, I, I came from the country originally, I came from Orange. Oh, that's a lovely, lovely town. It is. It's very lovely. And, you know, if you, if you move away from the cities, there's some really nice areas to live in the, the capital cities. What I would I recommend to people, though, that if they if they can't move away from the city because they have to they have to be close to their office or they for some reason they have to live in Sydney, then uh, you know rather than stretching yourself to try to buy a property in Sydney, which might extend your budget or you might end up getting something that's too small for what you need, like a, an apartment instead of a house, I'd recommend people do consider you know rent vesting. So sort of just rent a property where you need to live in Sydney, but still get onto the property market by buying investment property in one of those regional markets, which will then give you good cash flow. You run to the property ladder, so you've got uh, those opportunities for growth and everything like that as well. So there's, there's all sorts of reasons you know, to invest in those markets. It doesn't have to be to live in a property, but certainly just get onto that property market ladder. Now, rent invest, you touched on this. What is rent investing and how important should it be for someone's strategy? Is it something that people should follow or should they buy their own house first? Well, that's that's really interesting. Now, when I wrote my book, Positively Geared, I talked a lot about rent investing and the strategy there because I'm very much in all about strategic investing and, and what that actually means. So rent investing is essentially where you rent a property where you need to live or where you want to live. So if you're if you're living near the beach in you know in Bondi in Sydney, for example, and you need to work in the city then, you know, that might be very expensive. Well, it is very expensive to buy. It might be out of your budget to buy a home there. So you can rent there uh, rather than buying your own home. And then you, you're better off placing your money elsewhere to invest. And that might be in a cheaper location. Because keep in mind also that wherever you live is not necessarily the best investment place in the, in the country either. Mm -hmm. Depending on what your needs are, what your strategy is, 
uh, you can invest elsewhere, you know, in another city, another suburb, another state, and you might get better cash flow and still plenty of opportunities for growth. So that's the concept behind rent vesting. Rent, rent where you, you need to live, but invest, buy a property elsewhere. But what that also does is it helps your own serviceability with the banks. If you go and buy your own home first, then remember, you've got to pay a mortgage on it and Mm -hmm. nothing tax deductible. And it can actually stop you in your tracks. So when you go to buy another property, you might be already maxed out. So my suggestion, and this is where people also need to have a conversation with perhaps a good mortgage broker and maybe their accountant or even financial advisor. Because again, I like to sort of talk about having a, a whole team of people around you to advise on this. But if people were to, to look at investing in a property rather than buying their own home, then investing means that you can actually claim everything for tax there, but you're also getting income from that property through the rent. And that rent will help your serviceability. So you've probably got a much better chance to then buy another property. And you're going to start building a portfolio that way rather than having your own home. And then buying your own home can be something that you can do a little bit later on. And that could be part of a longer term strategy for what you're trying to achieve. So if you're if you're in your 20s and you're just starting to you know get into the property market, you don't have to buy that great Australian dream as your first home. You, you could buy a, a great Australian dream type property, but it can be an investment in you know another regional market somewhere. And then you can look at buying your own home a little bit later on. And you'll have a much better chance of getting finance from the banks to build up that portfolio. And it's all tax deductible, so it'll it'll help you with your overall finances as well. You do see so many people, and you touched on this, the the dream home, so many young people investing big on their dream home. Do you have views on this? Well, I I do. And I think one of the, the issues with that is that I think a lot of young people these days want to have maybe what their parents had or what they saw their parents as having had. Now, what what do people don't sort of realise is that even 30 years ago, their parents were in the same situation. Like whatever house as a, as a child you grew up in is probably not the first home your parents owned either, but that's all you remember as a child. And they think, oh, well, I want my own home now, so I want this big big house that, that my parents had. Yeah, my view is to really, uh, you really need to work up to that and, you know, maybe make some sacrifices there. So, you know, when I started, you know, investing in property, I, uh, you know, was buying obviously investment properties, but I also lived in a in a one bedroom a, apartment. And then when I, you know, when I bought my own home to to live in as part of my overall strategy, it was actually in an outer suburb in Sydney, and it was quite a long a long way for me to commute to work and everything. So I was making sacrifices there. I wasn't trying to buy my own home, you know, right near the beach or anything like that straight off. So I did make those sacrifices so, uh, with a long term plan that eventually I would be able to buy that dream home. You know, by the water, but that was a, a longer term view. So I think that you know it's really important to to consider the the long term plan that you have and to make some sacrifices, but enjoy the journey as well. I think that's lovely, actually enjoying the journey. There's been a lot of studies done about how the average footprint of houses has really increased over the years, and sometimes that doesn't actually bring more happiness. Well, that's absolutely right, and you have got to remember that if you get your dream home, but then you're absolutely bored to the hilt and you're, you're struggling to pay it off, then that's not going to bring a lot of happiness either. So it's really important to be comfortable being in a good financial situation, be be comfortable with your family, enjoy your, your family and, and work up to that. So, you know, you can be happy rent vesting or you can be happy living in a smaller property to start with and then have those goals. What, one thing that's always driven me is uh, the goal is to try to, to better myself and better my financial circumstances. Yeah, you know, I'm always thinking, okay, what can I achieve next? What can I do for my family? What uh, and things like that. Mm. So, you know, if you if you buy that mega mansion at 25, then where are you going to go from there? So, you know, I like to be able to work up to that and realize that, you know, maybe in, in your 40s, that's where you might be able to have something like that rather than than straight away and enjoy that journey and, and invest in other properties and, and realize that that's part of my goal and um, I'm going to enjoy the cash flow I'm getting for that investment property and it's going to help me get into another property and then I'm going to buy, maybe buy a property where I'm going to renovate because that's going to add some equity to that property and that's going to help me get into another one and, and, and then eventually it's going to help me buy my dream home. So, you know, have some goals in place uh, and, and really enjoy uh, the journey along the way with, with you know, with your loved ones that you are uh, on the journey with. So have you achieved the the home by the water? Yeah, I have. Yeah, absolutely. And um, again, I, I talked about that in both the books I wrote because not not to brag about what I've done, but to well, talk well, about Well, why not? I've if you've achieved it. it, you set a goal. There's not many trombone players who can 
go from being a poor muso to amassing a property empire? Well, that's, yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, the reason I actually wrote, particularly, you know, when I wrote my first book, Positive Year, was actually to get my message out there. And it wasn't to, it wasn't written as a lead magnet or anything. It was actually written with the concept that if I can do it, so can you. So it, it was it was about my backstory and it was about the strategies I used to get to where I am now. And that, you know, if I can do it, being a struggling musician and, and everything like that, then, you know, other people can do that as well. And, I, and you know, as a buyer's agent, I work with a lot of people, you know, people like nurses and teachers and firemen and, you know, people like that who are on sort of the lower type incomes. But, you know, we're setting the strategies and helping them to, to achieve those sort of goals. So what I sort of outlined uh, in my book was, was how I got there and, and the fact that I took me quite a few years to get there and the strategies I used, the different properties that I bought to help my, myself get there. But, but, but yeah, I do, I do now have that home on the water and um, I've also recently bought myself a holiday home in another location down the south coast, which is also not, not far from the water as well. But again, those, you know, they're, they're sort of things that I've sort of built up over you know, amount of time. So it didn't happen in you know, one or two years. It was something that I was working towards and you know, got there. And I think it's important for people to realise that if you set a goal and you really work towards it, it is possible to get there. I love this story and I really love your story about the long-term goal, especially too with the rise of crypto investing and people being able to brag about how they're millionaires overnight. It seems that there's a real trend towards people thinking, seeking the get-rich path. Yeah, and, and that's so true because, like, I, for some reason, like, I... For example, I don't do uh, crypto uh, because what's really important to me is it should only invest in things that you understand. Now, I don't understand crypto and, um, and I've never actually spoken to anyone who can actually explain, explain it to me. So either I'm not very smart or people haven't explained it to me properly. So again, for me, you know, property is something that's, that's tangible, that, um, that I really understand how, how I can get there. And it's a long-term thing. So people shouldn't really jump on that bandwagon and think that uh, oh, they should you know, jump on crypto and they're going to become millionaires overnight because you know it doesn't doesn't really happen and if it does happen then it's, it's very volatile and you know the next night they can also become broke again so you really need to look at what you're trying to achieve and, and this is this comes back to strategy as well and, and what the goals are because when I work with people I always ask them what well, what's your long-term goals what are you trying to to achieve and most people have some idea of whether they're looking to achieve, you know, financial independence, buying a dream home, putting the kids through school, or whatever. Occasionally, I get someone who says, "Oh, I don't know, really, I just want to buy lots of property and become really wealthy." But that's not a goal because you, we need to have a strategy in place. Like, if you want to retire, for example, if you're making a hundred thousand a year in income and you want to achieve that in passive income so you can retire, then that's a goal, and then we can set a strategy on how many rental properties you need to buy to be able to achieve that. For example. But there's no point just saying, yeah, I want to be a multimillionaire because what do you want to do that for? I mean, what are you going to do with the money? So you need to have goals in place and realise that it's sort of a long term to get there and not just jump on the back of what someone else is doing, thinking that, oh, they're, they're getting rich doing that. Because quite often when someone else is getting rich doing something, they're probably not getting as rich as you think they are <laughs> because people often come out and they, they talk about all these things and you know, make it sound really exciting. But, you know, you just need to be a little bit careful of that as well, I think. Yeah, exactly. And even if they are doing really well, well, maybe they that trend is finished. So they did that, it worked, and then it's moved on. I mean, sometimes it is genuine. Well, that's right. But I think in terms of crypto, I mean, I think people who jumped on it back in 2010, 2011 might have done very, very well. But now it's just a trend that everyone's sort of jumping on. You know, people need to be careful of that now because maybe that trend's kind of, kind of finished a little bit there. But it's a little bit like with, with property that when I look at, you know, markets to invest in, I try to look in the upward swing of the cycle and also try to get into areas before they boom and before others hear about it. You know, I, I sort of do some research there, look at what the government's spending there on infrastructure, look at the demographics and where I see the jobs growth and the population growth. And if it's an area that hasn't been I talked about much, but I see potential there, I like to jump in there and, and buy some property there before others hear about it. Because by the time others hear about it, it's usually too late. So if you read about a, an area in, say, one of the property magazines, it's probably already boomed and everyone's already jumped on it. So it's a bit, bit, bit late. So they've got like a lag time of a few months. So you need to be ahead of the game like that. Uh, and that's sort of like with, with anything there, you need to just jump on things a little bit ahead. So true. And you have to trust your instincts with it too. Back in 2017, Hubby wanted to buy some property. So this is our second marriage and we hadn't long been together. And he'd sold the family home or was about to sell the family home and wanted to invest in property. 
And so we looked at a few things around near where I live. Now, I live where I do because of lifestyle. It's very close to some really excellent schools for my kids. They walk there. In fact, both of the schools, for various reasons, they're in, I'm in the catchment area, but they're category A schools and they could not attend those schools unless they were in the catchment. And it's just worked out really well. They really like the school, so it's great. But we looked at properties for an investment nearby. And I never forget, my husband said to me, I could buy two for the same price in Queanbeyan. Now, Queen Vian's just across the border from Canberra. It's traditionally been known as Struggle Town. Many of my Canberra friends would not live there. They'd refuse to live there. They'd turn up their noses. Well, pity them. But <laughs> anyway, I went, okay, well, let's, let's have a look at Queen Vian then. Like, let's have an open mind here. So we had a look at some properties. And I remember he picked me up from work one day. And it was 15 minutes from where I was working to Queen Vian, which was actually closer from my inner city apartment to there because of roadworks and traffic and so forth. And I went, seriously, 15 minutes? And he's like, yes. And then there were quite a few other things that were happening and the local council could see they were doing amazing things. They would had a whole new lifestyle precinct that had really renovated things. And I was like, how do people not know about this? So we bought two apartments. And I remember going back into the office and people said, oh, you'd never buy in Queanbeyan. Like, why on earth would you go to Queanbeyan? I was like, have you done the sums? Have you talked to people? Have you looked at the rental vacancies? And at at that time, there were so many properties on the market that had been on the market for months and months and no one wanted them. But I kid you not, 12 months later, it was Queanbeyan is the hotspot for investing. But at the time, it was really hard to back your instincts because everyone kept telling me I was crazy. No, and look, I, I agree with that because um, I was one of those people that was actually looking into Queen Beer, <laughs> and that this is this is a good this is going to be a good spot to to buy into because it's a spot that no one really heard of. Uh, people think of oh, Queen Beer, and it's like that's just <laughs> of nowhere. That's kind of like you kind of go near there when you're on your way to Canberra or something, and that's about all people would talk about. But no, that's um, that's definitely a um, a good example of, of of an area that's outside the traditional. Areas. You know, people always talk about these these bigger markets. Uh, you know, if you're going to go regional, people often talk about, you know, maybe you know, obviously buying Canberra is good, but people talk, will talk about the Wollongongs and the Newcastles and all that kind of stuff. But these these other markets. Another market I I used to talk about a lot is Orange, and not because I am from Orange, but also but just simply because it's it was always I thought it was going to be a really good investment spot because of what was happening in the in the town. And, you know, the last couple of years has had massive amounts of growth, about 77% growth. Wow. So, it's, you know, it's been huge. And, you know, I've had a few clients go in there and buy a property that literally, you know, they buy a property for 400000 and get it, you know, valued a year later to be worth like, you know, 650000 You know, massive, massive amounts of growth. You know, so it is about getting ahead of things. And, and you do need to sort of back your, back your instincts a bit, which can be can be difficult to do at times if you've got, I mean, that's the way I've always sort of invested. So I've always sort of backed myself a bit. When I first started investing, it's a bit nerving to do that because I thought, well, I, you know, what makes me think I know anything better than anyone else does. So I was a little bit always going out on a limb a little bit, but fortunately most of the time I was fairly successful in that. But it is what you need to do because if you just go where everyone else is going, you'll get the same results as everyone else. But so many people, when they buy property, they don't do the research though. They go along to an open house, they look at the colouring scheme, they can imagine them being there as a family, and they ask the real estate agent for advice. Now, real estate agents are great. I love real estate agents. I love having a good chat. But the thing is, they are acting for the seller. They're not acting for you as the buyer. So you've got to take the advice they give you with a grain of salt, because of course, they're going to tell you that the property's fabulous. Uh, Absolutely. And of course, you've got to remember with a real estate agent that they're they're just going to sell you tell you what, um, uh, you know, properties they've got uh, are good and, and only the ones that are on their books and everything, which is the other thing to think about as well, whereas, you know, you need to sort of look at, you know, every property that's on the market and do proper research on them. I thought it was really funny, just as a little bit of a side story here. I was buying a house for ourselves down, down the south coast and I was going out to real estate agents looking at a few different properties and I, I, and I had to, the, the, one of the agents was telling me what properties I'd be looking at, and I mentioned one particular property, which is actually the one I ended up buying. But before I bought it, that was sort of the one that was at the top of my list. And I just said, "Yeah, I've just been over and looked at this this property on this particular road." And he said, "Oh, that's a, that's a terrible road. It's really busy. You don't want to buy on that road." <laughs> and of course, he was saying that because he wasn't selling me the property. But what was really funny is that he took me to another road that was very busy, much worse than the road I was, wanted to buy on. So he he took me to a worse property much more expensive on a worse road. But he was selling it and he's trying to tell me what a great property and what a great street it is. And it was bizarre because I was thinking like, but you know, this is this is this is actually a busy road compared to the road I wanted to buy, which is 
remotely busy, but it's also right near the beach and, and, and opposite the golf course. So it was actually really well located. Mm-hmm. So just an example of, you know, real estate agents will tell you anything to try to skewer away from one property and go to another. So you do need to take that as a grain of salt and do proper research. Yeah, definitely do proper research. And one of the things I, I kind of wish I'd done when I bought my apartment and I sort of look back and go, I don't know why I didn't have the nerve to do this, but I wish I'd actually act- knocked on the doors of the neighbours and actually spoken to the neighbours because I would have learned some really interesting things. Yeah, so that's one of the things I do as a buyer's agent is that we do knock on the doors of the locals. And when we look at properties, we also, we might go and uh, inspect the property, say, in the morning, but we'll also go back in the afternoon and do a bit of reconnaissance there. So we want to sit out the prop- outside the property at night, make sure there's uh, no noisy dogs next door or that there's no one growing a drug lab or, or anything like that. So all those sort of things that you can't you can't really tell uh, just by having a look at the particular property in question. So it's about getting to know the street better. And and also, you know, when you get to know an area, you know, drop into the police station. And and it's okay to ask real estate agents, but not the person you're buying the property from, just, just in general, just drop into some other agencies. Uh, drop into the corner store. There's a corner store there. Ask, ask the locals. You know, that sort of research. That's what I believe in a lot because a lot of the time, you know, people do research and if they're getting help, uh, like they might be using a, um, you know, a, a marketing company or advice agent to help them buy a property and they're getting a lot of research on the, uh, on the area, that's all well and good, but it doesn't really tell you that much because, it's, uh, you know, research can just be put together about, yeah, this is, this is all the infrastructure that's going in the area, this is why it's good to buy and whatever, but you really need to go there. And if you can't go there and you want, you're, you're getting help with someone, you know, who's helping you buy the property, yeah, that's, that's kind of why we go sort of a step further. We want to ask those locals, we, we want to pound the pavements and we want to find out, you know, is this really a good area? You know, would I live in this area or should I stay away from this street? Uh, things like that. So they're, they're the things that you, you, you really, really need to go that step further, really understand the area. That just reminds me of that movie years ago. Was it Seven? I can't remember with Gwyneth Paltrow and I think Brad Pitt in where they bought this in an apartment and they didn't realise it was directly, I think, under a train line or next to a train line. And the agent used to bring them in at these strategic times when when the whole house wasn't rat- rattling. Yeah, that's um, I, I yeah I can't remember the name of the movie. I know the one you're talking about, but yeah, absolutely, that's uh, that's a good example of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I actually never thought about that. And so, what a wonderful service that you provide because there's not many people who do that. They just go in when the property's looking fabulous at the best time, often in spring when the property's really looking really lovely. And there's no issues in Canberra, particularly a key issue is heating. A lot of people buy places not thinking about what type of heating or insulation's there. They'll just go in when it's looking lovely and warm and toasty and it's all happy and not think about all the other things. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I see my, my job as a buyer's agent is to not really tell people how good a property is because I, I take the emotion out of it. It's really about to tell people what's wrong with the property. So <laughs> whenever I source a property and present it to someone, it's, it's always going to meet their brief. So I'd say, you know, this property suits your strategy that we've discussed for X, Y, and Z. But, you know, once I've inspected it, I'd also say, okay, now these are the pros and these are the cons. Every property has a con now. So, I, you know, I would always always be saying, okay, uh, you know, we don't like the street for this particular reason or everything's good about the property, but the sun comes in um, the living room at, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, that may not be ideal all these sort of things. So uh, it, it, it's certainly important not to just highlight everything because a real estate agent who's selling the property is always going to say just the good things about the property. We want to highlight the whole thing about the property so you make a, an informed decision about whether that's the right one you know, to buy or not. There's so many things we could discuss. We could discuss things all day. But do you have a fi- – I've got a final question for you, which is do you have a frugalista tip to share? What's really important, I think, is that People need to, you know, have a budget, which sounds a little bit, you know, a little bit boring, but people really need to look at, you know, where all their spending goes. Because I think that one of the things that we're, we're seeing at the moment is people don't really understand where all their money's going. So people are spending, you know, maybe too much money on, you know, takeaway or on Netflix or on coffee. So be a bit more frugal, have a budget there. And then when you go out to buy property, one of the most important things is to buy under your borrowing capacity because people are getting themselves maxed out and can't move forward because uh, they're leveraging themselves too high. You know, have that budget, understand where everything's going and, and tidy, tidy that budget up a bit because one of the things that banks are doing these days is they really check your spending habits. So if you can tidy up your spending habits, you get a better chance of getting your loan approved and everything. Now, if you've been approved, let's say, for a million-dollar for a loan 
you don't have to go and buy a million dollar property. You can buy a property for you know eight fifty, for example, and that gives you a little bit of room left for you know if there's interest rate hikes and stuff like that, or, or potentially get into another property. So just 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 look at not over leveraging yourself and and keeping in mind the the fact that the interest rates are going to be moving, and you just don't want to overextend yourself. It's hard though when people get caught up in the heat of an auction. I've never had that experience of getting super carried away at an auction. In fact, I did buy my apartment at auction and I was the only bidder. And um... (laughs) (laughs) Um, there were all these other houses going above reserve and crazy stuff. And I went for the one there where there was no interest. I was very happy to do that. But it is hard. A lot of people do get caught up and um, agents do use a lot of tricks to help people get caught up in that. They do indeed. One of the things I'd advise on there is to really understand what the market's doing. So again, people don't quite understand what a property is actually worth. So you really need to research the comparables and understand what the property is really worth. So if a property is listed for a million dollars and you've got a budget of of a million dollars, that's the wrong property for you because auction price guides are usually at least 10% lower than what they expect to sell the property for. In a boom market, uh, probably 20%. So if a property's got an auction price guide of a, of a million, it's probably going to sell for 1.2, 1.3 million. So what you need to be doing if you've got a million dollar pre-approval is you need to be looking at those properties that might have auction price guide of 750 or 800. So you need to you know, come back, back to earth a bit and that might mean buying a, a you know a smaller property, something that's maybe a, uh, you know, a little bit simpler than what you had in mind, but that's, that's what you need to do. And therefore, you're not going to be, I guess, continuously disappointed because I do get a lot of people coming to me who've been trying to buy a property for the last two or three years and keep missing out. But a lot of the time is they're just looking at the wrong property. So we have to just manage those expectations and say, well, this is your budget. This is actually what you'll probably get for your budget. And quite often, you know, we can then go and actually buy the right property at auction. It's just about managing those expectations. Yeah, and there has been a lot of criticism about real estate agents in the past for allegedly setting prices that are unrealistic. But it is really hard in a boom market to know what's going to happen. Well, over the last couple of years, it's been even harder than that because I think to, to a lot of extent, the agents didn't even know what uh, the properties were going to sell for. But it's been, I mean, I've, I've been to auctions lately where, you know, particularly last year, where the, the price guide might have been, you know, 2 million and then it, it sold for like 3.7 million. Wow. So just, um, ridiculous. Um, I remember one auction I went to and, um, yeah, the auction price guide was 2.2 million. And um, I was bidding on behalf of my client and my, my client's budget was uh, 3 million. And I thought, oh, we're, we're in a really pretty, pretty good chance then because I, I'd sort of looked at the markets, pretty familiar with that suburb, and I thought, yeah, we, sh- we should have a pretty good chance of getting it for just sort of under the three million, which is still a long way above what the price guide was. But the the opening bid was three point one million, so above automatically above my clients off uh, my clients um, budget. Wow, that's a very big opening gambit. And uh, two two point two price guide first offer first first bid was three point one million. So we were out straight away, and the property sold for about three point nine. Yeah, just just huge. So um, that you know, that was just a, an example of it was just just crazy, you know, crazy bidding there. You know, people just uh, and this and this was a this was a virtually a knockdown property anyway. There was uh, you couldn't live in it. Wow, so it, was, it was crazy location. Uh, that's what you do on some in Sydney sometimes. Uh, so that's that's an example. But but when things slow down uh, like they are at the moment, the auction clearance rates slow down, and uh, you know you have a sort of a better chance of properties maybe being passed in and then being able to negotiate and things like that. But you know where possible, it's it's better to try to buy not at auction. Um, I never tr- I never try to buy at auction for an investor because I think you'll always pay a bit too much, and as an investor, you want to be trying to pay less. As a homeowner, you know if you can negotiate the property off market before auction, that's that's ideal. Can because it can just save you from paying an extra a bit too much. Well, thank you so much for being my guest. I think I could have talked for hours about property. You've just got such a wealth of information to share for people. Where can they reach you and find you? Website is ozpropertyprofessionals.com.au and the uh, the phone number and is one eight hundred one four six eight three seven. I think. And, uh, <laughs> you need and, to remember uh, your the, phone number. <laughs> <laughs> all the uh, all the contact details are on the website. Um, both my books, Possibly Geared and Buy Now, are available in all good bookshops, QBD, Collins, Dimix, and also available online at yeah, Booktopia and Amazon and everything like that. So, yeah, so people would love to uh, grab a copy and just have a read. There's there's a few tips and strategies in there for, for people. Not everyone necessarily wants to use a buyer's agent, which is why I've, I've put those books out so people can just get some some tips and stuff on what to do anyway. So, so, you know, feel free to just grab a copy of the book and have a read. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. 
You've been listening to The Joyful Frugalista with Serena Bird. And of course, sound has been by Neil Hadley. I'm